one way to appreciate higher dimensional objects is to fold them out into a lower dimensional space that uh, we are used to. So for example, think of taking a four dimensional cube and unfolding it into three dimensional or two dimensional space. Um, and in this video, we are going to focus on the latter where you can unfold it onto a table and uh, then study its properties that way. Now, unlike other math videos, this one is not just a story, but it is a call to a quest as we'll see. For the dragon that is the subject of this video has not yet been slain either by me or by anyone else. And that dragon is the number of ways to do this. But we are getting a little ahead of ourselves. In terms of the outline of this video, first we will talk about opening uh, familiar 3D uh, boxes or cubes. Uh, then we will learn how to see in four dimensions. Uh, then different ways to open a four dimensional box, first into three dimensional space. And finally uh, opening it uh, onto your table. So let's start with the universal experience of opening up a three dimensional box, perhaps with a nice present inside. So imagine you got this package you were expecting from Amazon or some other shopping website, which is inside a cubicle box. The box is so pretty that you want to save it and to still get the package inside, you make some cuts to it denoted by these yellow lines in a way that the faces still stay connected to each other. This allows you to open the box up onto the floor like this. If you keep folding, all the six faces first neatly fit into a single square so you can store it and finally you get back the original cube. So let's put a grid on the floor so we can visualize the total number of ways of opening the box up in this manner. And as we'll see here, there are 11 such distinct meshes for opening this 3D cube onto two dimensional space. To be able to visualize four dimensional objects on your two dimensional screen, we'll have to take a bit of a detour into how perspective projection works, which is to say even in 3D space, how objects that are far away appear smaller. Take this scene with a road stretching out to the horizon. All objects, trees, people that are closer to us appear bigger and the objects that are farther away from us appear smaller. And imagine a square tunnel sitting in the middle of this road. Again, the, the entrance of the tunnel which is closer to us appears bigger and the exit of the tunnel which is farther away appears smaller. Looking at this tunnel on its own, if we turn it around, the face that was smaller now becomes bigger. Now imagine this tunnel was really the projection of a four dimensional cube. The 3D cube that is further away from us in the fourth dimension will look smaller just like the back face of the tunnel looked smaller. But if we rotate this 4D cube around, we see that that back cube is just as big as any of the other cubes. And rotating it back, it appears small again. Now this 4D cube is really a collection of eight three-dimensional cubes. Let's bring this out by highlighting some of those cubes. If we rotate the other seven cubes onto the plane of the red cube, we get this symmetric looking three-dimensional mesh. And this is actually the subject of a famous painting that Salvador Dali made in 1954. The painting looks something but not exactly like this. 
if we keep rotating we get a reflected version of our original 4d cube rotating further all eight cubes fold neatly into a single three-dimensional cube making for easy storage and then we get back the original cube so there are many different ways of flattening the four-dimensional cube to three-dimensional space and you get a variety of uh, three-dimensional meshes I have visualized four of them here now the total number of these meshes was counted fairly recently in 1984 and that's when computers were first becoming prevalent and there's 261 uh, such meshes and these meshes were visualized uh, even more recently in 2015 so there is a link where you can actually go and uh, play with the meshes uh, I'll put it in the description and this is what it looks like but here's something that surprised me not only is it possible to flatten the 4d cube to three-dimensional space it is also possible to flatten it to two-dimensional space where the 24 faces all fall onto the floor in a way that none of them overlap with each other and if you keep folding you get a reflection of the original 4d cube folding it further collapses it into a square which you can store in your cupboard and then you finally get back the original cube now the natural question is how many such two-dimensional meshes you can get by flattening out the four-dimensional cube onto your table and I visualized four of those meshes here I can tell you there's at least a thousand because I've collected a thousand I can also tell you there's less than 10 to the power 16 and it's much less than 10 to the power 16 it's probably going to be on the order of millions or billions but 1000 to 10 to the power 16 is a very wide range what is the exact number of these two dimensional meshes and as of publishing this video I can tell you no one in the world knows the answer to that question so how do we even attack counting problems like these uh, first of all there's probably no closed form solution so there's no formula that you can write on a piece of paper and voila that's the answer um, so uh, typically you need a computer to solve uh, these kind, kinds of uh, counting problems and one approach uh, amongst many others is to find a larger combinatorial object uh, where the the thing that you want to count in this case the number of meshes of different cubes um, is, is a subset of this larger combinatorial object you find and this larger combinatorial object should be easy to iterate over in a computer then what you can do is you can iterate through all the uh, elements of this larger object and uh, reject the ones that you don't want to count and you know count uh, the thing you are interested in that way kind of like uh, a factory where you know there's a conveyor belt and various stones are flowing through and then you have some uh, some uh, you know workers sorting them out uh, into bins where you know the valuable ones go into one bin um, etc to see a concrete example of this let's bring back our three-dimensional cube first note that this three-dimensional cube has 12 edges uh, four on the top and four on the bottom and then four on the side so four times three is 12 and once we open it up into a two-dimensional mesh how many edges remain let's count them up one two three four five let's look at another one open it up into another mesh and let's count the edges one two three four five again this isn't a coincidence it turns out that if you think of the faces of Q of the cube as vertices of a graph and an edge between those vertices whenever two faces are connected then these meshes we are looking at are trees uh, meaning that from one face to another face there's only one path 
connecting them. And it turns out that uh, it's a property of trees, which are these special kinds of graphs, uh, that a tree will always have n minus 1 edges when there are n vertices. So because there are six faces here, there will always be five connecting edges. Uh, and you can look up the proof of this fact that a tree always has n minus 1 edges when there are n nodes uh, online. So now we know that our cube has 12 edges, but all of the meshes, two dimensional meshes we are counting have exactly 5 edges. This means that we must choose 7 of the 12 edges so we can cut them and that would mean 5 edges remain for, for our mesh. Now iterating over combinations is something you can do in many programming languages. For example, here's some Python code. But not all of those combinations will create the kinds of valid meshes we want. For example, if you choose uh, seven the seven cuts in this manner then that will not lead to a valid mesh because the top face will get completely separated from the remaining ones here's another choice of seven cuts out of 12 that will separate two of the faces from the rest of the cube and again we don't want this Apart from the problem of invalid meshes, we also have to worry about duplication. For example, let's choose these seven cuts for the cube on the left and this different set of seven cuts for the cube on the right. Now let's open the first cube and then the second one. Now these might look like different meshes. But if we rotate the first one, we see that it's really the same as the second one. So we see that there are a total of 12 choose 5, which is 792 uh, total ways to pick uh, the 7 cuts or pick the 5 edges that are not going to get cut. Um, of those 792, only 384 lead to valid meshes, which means that it doesn't involve the cube getting cut, cut out into two or three pieces. And in those 384, there is a lot of duplication. And uh, it turns out that we get only 11 distinct mesh shapes. And again, here are those uh, 11 shapes. So this lends itself to this algorithm where you loop through all 12 choose 5 or 12 choose 7 combinations. Uh, some of the combinations again won't be valid meshes so you discard those and amongst the ones that are valid meshes uh, you take care to deduplicate meaning that if you've already seen the mesh before and the new one you're seeing is just a rotated or translated version um, then you kind of discard it as a duplicate and uh, once this algorithm runs it iterates through all the 792 possibilities you're going to be left with the 11 meshes the deduplication by the way can be done very efficiently uh, in constant time and here's some code in python uh, that that would help you loop through the combinations again so we'll assume it takes us one millisecond to process each combination of cuts and this includes seeing if it's a valid mesh seeing if it's a duplicate of a previous mesh this uh, isn't easy but it's definitely not impossible and then if you budget one millisecond for that then uh, to get through the 792 combinations uh, you need about 0.792 seconds or, or 0.8 seconds so in less than one second uh, your code would have returned the 11 distinct meshes now just as in the 3d cube each edge was connecting two of the faces in the tesseract, each 2D face connects two of the three-dimensional cubes that make up the tesseract. Now remember there are 24 2D faces in the tesseract and eight 3D faces. The final mesh is going to have uh, seven uh, of these 24 edges remaining uh, because it's a tree and a tree has 
8 minus 1 or n minus 1 uh, edges and so of these 24 24 minus 7 uh, which is uh, 17 uh, need to be cut now the number of ways to choose seven of the faces 2d faces to cut out of the 24 possible uh, 2d faces in a tesseract is about 364000 and again if we assume we budget 1 millisecond per combination uh, the whole algorithm will be done in one hour which is uh, not too bad now coming back to the problem of flattening the tesseract onto 2d space which is the unsolved problem the number of ways to count that we are back to one dimensional edges connecting uh, two dimensional faces and the total number of one dimensional edges in a tesseract is 32 and the number of two dimensional faces as we saw before is 24 so of those 32 um, 20 24 minus 1 which is 23 uh, should should remain uncut uh, in order for us to do this and the number of ways to choose the 23 edges out of the 32 that will not be cut is about 28 million and again if we budget one millisecond for each combination uh, we should be done with the entire computation in seven hours uh, which is, isn't so bad right you let a computer run for a week um, loop through all these 28 million and you should be done so in that case why haven't i already done it and of course there's a catch the catch is that unlike the 3d cube where each physical edge was connecting two faces in the tesseract or 4d cube each physical edge connects three faces uh, not two so each of the 32 physical edges of the tesseract has three face connections not just one and that means there are a total of 32 times 3 which is 96 face connections in the tesseract and here we are talking about the two dimensional faces and we need to retain 23 of them because again there are 24 faces and we are going to get a tree and uh, the total combinations then becomes 32 times 3 choose 23 not 32 choose 23 like I said before and 96 choose 23 is 10 to the power 22 combinations like before let's say we budget one millisecond uh, for processing each combination this algorithm is going to run for 100 billion years for context the universe is 13 billion years old so this combination based strategy looping through the combinations of edges to cut works for the case of a 3d cube opening to 2d space it also works fine for a 4d cube opening to 3d space you would need 7 hours but for a 4d cube opening to 2d space you would need 100 billion years and this becomes infeasible now what i like about this problem is that uh, it's a mathematical counting problem but in order to solve solve it you need to invoke efficient algorithm development it has fee aspects of fields like linear algebra of course combinatorics but also computer science disciplines like graph theory and dynamic programming and then of course there's the thrill of trying to chase down the solution of a problem that no human being dead or alive knows the answer to